Hey there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. Today I have my November wrap-up part two for you guys. It is non-fiction November, but I knew I wasn't going to get through the whole month without at least a little bit of fiction, so there's some fiction. I got some non-fiction. I have a Goldsmiths Prize uh, shortlisted book as well, so let's get into it. First is Mating the Huntress by Talia Hibbert. This is a paranormal romance. It is short. It's novella, like 130 some odd pages. It's about Chastity, who comes from a long line of werewolf hunters, and all of the women in her family are these huntresses. The werewolves of this world are not very human-like, and they're not very pretty, and they don't sparkle, and they need to be killed every now and then, so that's what the women in her family do. However, Chastity has been told that she cannot kill any werewolves, and it annoys her. She, she wants to go and do that. So when she finally meets a werewolf in the form of Luke, as a human, obviously, she decides that this is her chance. Little does she know that she and Luke are fated mates and that things will go on from here. Fated mates is a weird trope that you find a lot in paranormal and it can be really poorly done. It can make me really mad. And here, Hibbert managed to make it work. Chastity especially fights against this attraction that they feel for each other and she's determined to kill this guy because he's a werewolf and a lot of funny scenes believe it or not ensue it's rather light it's short a lot of hibbert's work can have like um trauma and abuse in it and this only has a one small mention of rapists but no actual rape or anything in the story and i liked it for that the story fits its page count mostly for the most part, but I wanted to see this built out into an entire world. I feel like there's a really good skeleton here for what could become a paranormal romance or urban fantasy-esque kind of series. And some of the lore is interesting and there's enough characters where this could be spun out. So that was a bit disappointing, but in the way that I just, I wanted more of it. It's interracial romance written by a black woman. Consent is all over the place. Just because the dude is a werewolf doesn't mean that he won't listen when the girl says no. It may be one of my favorite by Hibbert because the other two that I've read, one had a suspense storyline that I could have done without and the other one dealt with a lot of abuse in the present tense, which I also didn't like so much, but this was great. I'd love to see her write more like this. Next is the book Crudo by Olivia Lang. This book was shortlisted for the Goldsmiths Prize and I did a whole video on that which I'll link up here and down below. Every year I tried to read at least a book or two. I read this one. I also tried, I think it's Rachel Cusk, um, the third book of her trilogy. I went back and read the first one and I wasn't digging it. it the writing style just wasn't for me so I let that one go. And this one though, I did finish. This is a book about Kathy. Kathy is getting married for the third time. It's 2017 and this book is basically a snapshot of what it was like to live in mostly the summer of 2017. All of the scary stuff in the news, all of the thoughts that were at top of mind, and all of those things rolled into a rather short novel. It took me a while to get into the style of this novel. I think I've never read Lang before and I almost felt like I couldn't allow myself to sink into it because I knew this is up for a prize and I wanted to have all of my senses going and analyzing and trying to figure out what is cool and what's going on and looking at it through that more super critical lens, which I would have been much better doing without. I read the first 40 pages that way in a cafe, put it down for a while, and when I picked it back up, I was able to blast through the rest of it because I think part of it is because I was at home with a nice warm blanket and hot water bottle and I literally just sunk into her writing and stopped worrying about exactly what she was trying to do and just let it wash over me, which was the best thing. The writing is wonderful. I ended up using post-its for bunches of lines that I just want to remember. There's just a tiny little bit of plot. And for me to get into a book, I really do need at least some plot. This is at the very lower minimum level required to keep me interested. I see why other people like it. I see why it was nominated for the Goldsmiths Prize. And I can see how good it is, but it's just not particularly my kind of literary fiction. Next is a book that was not on my radar, but Haymarket Books had a 90% off sale all of their digital books. So I went a little crazy and I picked up, I think, four and it cost me less than five dollars. 
does it get any better than that? Anyway, the book I picked up is a chap book of poetry called On My Way to Liberation by H. Melt. Melt is trans and queer gender, and this book of poetry is about their experience in the world and what they envision trans liberation would look like. We sit next to Melt every day as they're misgendered and deadnamed and have to deal with injustice, and the poetry lets us feel what that's like. I'm grateful for this look into their experience to see what it's like to live as this particular transgender person, but I don't think the poetry itself, like the words, will stick with me. The images, the ideas behind the words will stick, but the actual, there's no lines that I wanted to quote or commit to memory or anything like that. I gave it three stars. If you're looking for a trans poet, here's a place to start. Personally, I classified that poetry collection as nonfiction because it's about their own personal experience. Some poetry that's very obviously fictional or fantastical, I may put into a fiction section, but this one for me was clearly nonfiction. Next, I needed a little bit more romance in my life, so I picked up A Season for Temptation by Teresa Romaine. This is her debut novel, and I've read some of her stuff in the past and liked it, so I thought I'd go back to this series. It's a Regency romance, and the setup is really interesting because we have Louisa, and she has recently come out for her first season, and she has become engaged with James. It's not a love match. Each one of them has some very strong, compelling personal reasons for wanting to get married, and they're sure that they will grow to love each other, but at the moment, it's, it's convenient. So they're engaged, and they start to meet the other's families, and when James meets Louisa's half-sister, Julia, they just hit it off. They have a similar sense of humor, they seem to get each other, and they think they might be slowly falling in love, which is a problem, because James is engaged to Louisa not Julia. The joy in this one is seeing how the scandal will play out, because it has to be a scandal. I mean, there's these two engaged people and the half-sister falls in love with a the guy. There's gonna be a lot of fallout from that. It was really interesting to see how she puts everything together in the end, like who's going to take the fall for whom, and in society, what would be considered the most scandalous and who could get away with stuff and who couldn't. Overall, it was okay. However, it did read like a first novel and it is, it's a debut. The first half is kind of slow. It never deterred me at all. It just could have used maybe a little bit more happening. And a lot of plotty bits are right at the end. And one of the plotty bits at like 83 or 86% really made me mad because a character from a hundred pages prior just pops in and ruins everything, which I didn't need. And this is not a spoiler, but at the end, James and Julia have been separated and it's because mostly James's fault. And so Julia goes, I'm just gonna wait for him to come to me. I'm not gonna go to him. Mm -mm. And I thought, yes, he needs to grovel. Let him come back. But then Julia's relatives come to her with the advice, no, you should go after what you should want. You shouldn't have to wait just because you're the woman. And I didn't feel like that matched. Like, yes, okay, I agree, you should go after what you want. But at the same time, Julia did absolutely nothing wrong. And I didn't see why she should have to be the one to go to him. He should have been coming to her with some good gravel going on, so. Yeah, I mean, it worked out, but uh. also if you're a stickler for historical detail, you might be a little annoyed. I frankly don't really notice all that much if something's amiss. However, there were some parts in here where I went mm -hmm. and kept reading. And if you're the kind of person where historical inaccuracies will take you out of a story, just skip this one. Teresa Romaine has tons of amazing books and she only got lots and lots better after this one. So just, just move on, don't start here. I'm glad to have read Romaine's debut novel. I'm also looking forward to reading the next book of the series as a buddy read with Katie from Doing Dewey. She's not a booktuber, she's a blogger and she does lots and lots of wonderful nonfiction reviews. So I'll link her down below so you can check her out. And the last book I have for you guys is nonfiction. I haven't finished it quite yet, but I don't think my opinion is gonna change. It's Letters from Max, a book of friendship by Sarah Rule and Max Riffo. Sarah Rule is a playwright. She originally wanted to be a poet, but she ended up doing the play thing. And she teaches at, I forgot it was Yale, and Max was one of her students. She recognized that there was something special about Max just from the very first time he walked into class. He seemed to be thinking about a lot of things, like bigger picture things and um, more 
philosophical things than a lot of his other classmates. It turns out that Max had cancer as a child and has been going through remission and different treatments and that this has shaped his worldview and made him not quite the normal college student. They kept in touch after Max finished the class and they wrote letters back and forth and it very quickly turned from a teacher-student thing to a more of a friendship thing and a fellow writer sort of thing. Through these letters we follow Max as he goes through several rounds of remission, rounds of chemotherapy, surgery, and all of the thoughts and feelings going between the two at this time. I didn't realize this going in, but there's a lot of poetry within the pages, some from Sarah, some from Max, and I especially love Sarah's poetry and knowing where it came from, seeing how they're spinning images out to each other in these letters and then seeing those same images come up in poems so that you see the meaning that they attach to it. Like there's one part where they're talking about soup and you know soup is comforting but the way that Max described his thoughts about soup was so much more than that and so whenever I see soup mentioned in a poem thereafter there's it's a lot deeper there's a lot more meaning there it's beautiful it's teary I mean I haven't sobbed or anything but there's some parts that are just so beautiful or so sad that I get leaky so it's not maybe the best book to read in public but I've actually really enjoyed reading it in the bath. It feels really like it makes sense. I'm surrounded by the water and if I cry it's just gonna fall into the bath anyway so who cares? It's it's comforting. It's a beautiful look at what friendship can be, what it can what it means to face death and there's talk of the afterlife and how each one envisions certain things and it's really beautiful. If you're looking for a book about friendship and hey oh, platonic friendship between cishet woman and cishet man, if you're interested to see what someone who is reaching the end of his life um, is thinking about and dealing with, if you're interested in a book about friendship, if you like letters, go ahead and check this out. There we have it, my November wrap up part two and I just want to give a big shout out to Nonfiction November and Olive from A Book Olive. I had an amazing time. I've loved watching everyone's videos. I look forward to seeing everybody's roundups and my nonfiction TBR has kind of sort of exploded. As much fun as I had in Nonfiction November, I am looking forward to December because I have nothing big planned, no read-alongs, nothing content oriented, so I'm planning to read whatever I want at that moment. It could be 10 romances in a row, it could be a bunch of fiction, and there's probably going to be some nonfiction in there too, but I'm just going to dive into the comfort reads and dive into all the fantasy that I've been missing and other things as well. So you'll have that to look forward to, as well as, of course, daily videos from here until Christmas. So subscribe if you're new, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye! Thank you.